different than a normal lecture considering the artist that we celebrate is not with us, but we are pleased to be able to celebrate a native son of Detroit, an alum of the Stamp School, referred to in the press as the artist with attitude, Mike Kelly. Yeah, and I know I've seen he, there some of his uh, friends in the audience here. It's great to have you with us, and we even have one of his high school teachers, Bob Curtis, is with us today, who brought some work that went for uh, his... his uh, foundation director to see, and that was amazing. So thanks for doing that, Bob. Um, I want to thank our partners whose support is made today possible, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, the Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts, the Ann Arbor Film Festival, and our series sponsors, Arts at Michigan and Michigan Radio, WUOM 91.7. Um, just a few words uh, today before we get started. New York Times art critic Holland Cotter described Mark, Mike Kelly as one of the most influential American artists of the past quarter century and a pungent commentator on American class, popular culture, and youthful rebellion. Uh, Mike did you know, study here at the university and his career took off and to major success, you know, his works are included in major public and private collections such as the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Broad Collection, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, and the Tate Gallery in London, and of course our own dear MOCAD here in Detroit. Uh, the world lost Mike Kelly last year, but his legacy does live on in his work and through his foundation. Uh, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit last year received a grant to complete Kelly's unfinished project, Mobile Homestead, which is a large-scale repli replica of his suburban home there where he grew up in Detroit. And you'll learn more about this work today, but I urge you to go and see it because you can experience it for yourself in Detroit at MOCAD, which is at the corner of Garfield and Woodward. Uh, and if you want to get out there this weekend, I just was told there is an event on Saturday, which sounds pretty fun, at 5 p.m. Aaron and Randy's wedding service is in the garage at Mike Kelly's house, and it's open to the public. It's going to be officiated by Reverend Carrie Lauren, whom you're going to meet right here on the stage in a moment. So, highly recommended. Uh, today, you're going to see two films made by Mike about the Mobile Homestead Project. Uh, and please do pass the word to your friends and family because these will also show next Thursday in Detroit at the DIA. Uh, we're not going to have our regular Q&A today, as obviously the artist is not with us. Uh, but today's pre presentation is a double feature as well. So we are going to have a 20-minute intermission, uh, but we're going to start with some words. We have uh, two of... Mike's longtime friends and collaborators here with us today to give us some words and some insight. Um, so we're going to start with that, followed by the first film, and then we'll have an intermission and show the second film. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Mary Claire Stevens with us today. She is the executive director of the Mike Kelly, F Kelly Foundation for the Arts. She's really here for a hot minute. She's here from New York as she is currently overseeing the install of a retrospective of Mike Kelly's work, which is opening this Sunday at MoMA's PS1. It will be up till February 2nd, so I advise everyone to get to New York and see this. Uh, Mary Claire has worked closely with Mike Kelly for the past 10 years in all aspects of his work, from production, exhibition, publication, archiving, and business management, and now is directing the foundation. But first, today, we're going to hear some words from Carrie Lauren, whose connection to Mike Kelly goes back to the early 70s, right here in Ann Arbor. Uh, Carrie Lauren himself is a filmmaker, musician, writer, and bookseller in Detroit. Uh, he was a founding member of the band Destroy All Monsters with Mike Kelly, Jim Shaw, and Niagara. He's currently working on a monograph of Lenny Sinclair and a history of the Detroit Artist Workshop. He's also the owner of a great bookstore called Bookbeat in Oak Park, Michigan, which you should visit if you haven't. So please join me in welcoming the Reverend Carrie Lauren. Thanks, Christina. Uh, it's fun to be here. Um, let's see. This We're going to start, I guess, uh, do, do I just uh, press uh, enter here or to get this first slide going? Oh, sorry, here, use this. Oh, this? And go this way. That way to forward it? So that, put your thumb on that. Okay, so, uh, okay, that, that's forward. Okay, well, this first photo here is uh, Mike and Jim inside uh, Jim's bedroom at God's Oasis. 
which was a kind of, um, this was the house like where everything happened. And it was at 741 uh, Packard. And it was right at the corner there, uh, uh, near, I think, campus corners. Uh, anyways, this, the first person that Mike met, he, he always said, was on the bus at orientation. He met Niagara there. And he described her as being a Warhol drag queen uh, who, who was kind of like a twisted version of Marilyn Monroe. And at that time, I was in high school at Berkeley High, and I'd, I'd drive my jalopy here on the weekends and uh, stay with Niagara, who was living uh, in the Helen Newberry house, which was this very strict, I don't know if you know the, you know, it's a dormitory for girls only place, and it was very hard to get in there. It was like Mission Impossible. And <clears throat> so we'd make these phone calls and arrangements. And I didn't know about Mike till later, till uh, 73 or 4, when I met him uh, at our... Um, at our place uh, on Hill Street. So I'm going to go through a couple of these things. This is a fort that they were building. It's Mike in the background in front of uh, uh, the Packard house. But you can see, oh, this Jim. Wait, in this one, you can see the God's Oasis Drive-In Church sign in the front that Jim found uh, in, in a, you know, garb, maybe an estate sale. And the uh, bomb was picked up out of a home site that they were digging through and they just found this missile, and so he hung it up there. And people thought it was a real church, and they would come there, and uh, people off the street all the time would just come in there. Uh, they also made these um, kind of Dadaist, futurist happenings uh, at East Quad. Uh, it, he called it the Futurist Ballet. That's Mike in a dress, and they, it, they essentially they would just put up these fake flyers for, uh, things that wouldn't happen, like for Duchamp lectures or, uh, you know, religious happenings. And, and then people would show up and they would just be going, you know, Mike would be squawking on the saxophone or they'd be reading, you know, abstract texts and surrealist uh, things. These were two of Mike's uh, big inspirations at, at U of M, uh, Jerome Kamrowski. Uh, I remember meeting, Jerome was kind of an abstract surrealist, uh, uh, painter and really a fun guy and uh, when Mike later became very well known every time he came to Detroit I drive him up there we'd look at his backyard and he wasn't usually home but when he was he would let us in and have tea and he was a great guy to be with and Falstrom was a was an artist Mike was fascinated with and he was somebody that um, Mike visited I think in 72 in uh, New York when he was having a sh uh, an exhibit there. And Mike said, I want to bring you to, to U of M and I want you to talk to the art school. And so they, they did bring him and Mike picked him up in his old jalopy and he was embarrassed because you know he didn't have a floor in his car and it was just you know really rusted out. And, and he had to, I remember at dinner he said that um, he was very embarrassed because nobody would pick up the, the bill for, for Ovend, and there was a big fight about it. And, uh, but uh, he, he later, I think it was a big lesson for Mike to learn about the art school and artists at that moment. Jack Smith was an artist that I had communicated with during high school, and he was a performance artist and a filmmaker into kind of low budget uh, exotica, I guess you would call it, a uh, very camp kind of style is how Susan Sontag would, would characterize it. And he was, I, after letter writing, he invited me to his, uh, his studio, to his, house, his apartment, and I stayed with him. And I, I brought back that aesthetic to, to Ann Arbor and started a, a, a performance space and a filmmaking space on Hill Street. This was right across from the White Panther Party headquarters. And it's another thing I think Mike and I had very close in, 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 in common was the, uh, the politics of John Sinclair and the White Panthers uh, and, and the music of the Stooges and MC5. And so we put on these things, and this is where I first met Mike and Jim. Uh, this is me inside the, this mouth of hell, and Mike is on the, in the lower right-hand side. He's putting on uh, one of Niagara's vintage tops. And we had a pile of costumes that we got at thrift stores that's Niagara at the top. 
Um, these are a couple of actors, Ingrid Good and uh, Paul Kazrin, who, is, who are also from uh, um, the Ann Arbor area and acted in a lot of our things. This is Niagara and uh, D.B. Keeps in this photo on the left. And then Francesca Palazzola, who was the, um, she was the daughter of the dean of the art school, Guy Palazzola. And she acted in films and hung out with us quite a bit. Mike was at that shoot, I remember. This is Jim playing uh, guitar, and he was, um, I have to say, he was just this amazing, he had an amazing look. He looked like a mad bomber, Jesus Christ kind of character. And he, he but he played uh, the guitar in such an unusual way with an echoplex and a fuzz box. And he just did incredible things. And Mike put together the last year of his life an eight CD set of his music. This is Mike from a, one of my films, The Blood of God, 1976. And um, this is him in the basement where, where he lived um, and where we practiced. That was, uh, that was our kind of um, practice area. Uh, this is Mike actually in his bedroom. His bedroom was a corner of God's Oasis in the basement. And you could tell it was Mike's bedroom because it was all painted pink just around his bed. And it is, but it was very neat. It was one of the neatest areas uh, in the whole house. And Mike was always, I think it was something maybe he picked up from his upbringing. He was very uh, fastidious and orderly. And he really had a lot of discipline that a lot of people don't realize. And he was quite, he was quite an intellectual as well. He was a good reader. He was reading Burroughs at this time. And we were both kind of good readers. And I think that's why maybe we, we got along well through books and through the avant-garde. This is me and some of, and Shaky Jake on the left. And Shaky Jake was kind of a, um, an amazing street musician from, from Ann Arbor, kind of fixture here for many, many years, maybe 30 years he, he lived here. And he, he played a guitar with one string or no strings. And he would say like, hippie girl, come on over, come on over here, hippie, hippie girl. He had a whole crazy routine, I can't, can't admit. And at the top is The Fruit, who was, one, The Fruit were one of Mike's favorite bands because they were so deconstructionist and they would just pick their singers out of the audience. And uh, they were just kind of like, they play these like um, nonsensical sets. And it was like theater t to watch this band. And of course, Sun Ra was another influence who was also kind of very theatrical and performance-wise. This is us. Um, this is us torturing Ron Ashton at uh, the Second Chance, um, and we saw this concert together. This in '75, and a couple years later, Ron, Ron would I would bother Ron to him constantly and got him into playing with uh, DAM, and he he would later join the band. Um, this. This guy is, uh, this was at the art fair of Ann Arbor. I took, took this in 76, and it, it was the first guy that bought uh, DAM Magazine, which is uh, a magazine I, I put out um, of our artwork of Niagara. It's Niagara's cover, and uh, here are some other covers that she painted. And I did this for, for about six years. Uh, no, not that long, 76 through 79, three years and six issues came out. And these are some of Mike's drawings at the time. He was a big fan of Wolverton and um, I'm trying to think, Stanley Mouse, you may, may have known, uh, local artists. But he loved these like hot rod monster creatures and he would do these exaggerated eyeballs and you know exaggerated noses and phallic uh, images. I don't know how I'm doing for time. This is, I'm gonna go through this section kind of fast because um, it's kind of the contemporary uh, era. For about 14, 15 years, I kind of lost contact, didn't lose contact with Mike, but we just, we just kind of had different lives and his life was in the art world. And I started a bookstore and we would see each other rarely. And so in 95 though, or 94, we, we got this idea of putting out our music again. And Thurston Moore had a small label and. He, he helped us get it together. And at the same time, I, I put together our, our writing and art in the uh, Geisha This book, and that's what's going on here. And this is um, the back room of the Book Beat, where we had the first archive show. 
And then it led to a show in, in Japan in 1996. We did a kind of a, an installation together there that never worked out quite well. And then in 98, we did this other, another installation uh, called, oh, this was for I Rip You, um, You Rip Me, was the name of it. It was a seminar in Rotterdam. And these were banners done, like cir big circus banners, um, done to kind of illuminate our history a little bit. Uh, and this was a, taken at the MCA. And th this, this group of work was called Strange Fruit. And it uh, later was in the uh, Whitney, Whitney Biennial, I believe. And then in 2009, a friend of mine who was working at uh, James Hoff, who was working at Printed Matter, uh, asked me if I'd be interested in doing an archive show at Printed Matter. A small, it's one of my favorite bookstores in uh, New York. Uh, and I said, sure, it would be great. So we put together this uh, show of the archives. And then that show would go on. and. Um, it toured, I think, went to Oslo and London, Rome and Paris and Athens and Rio. And it was, it was kind of this thing. In, in the, a matter of two or three years, it, it, it showed in seven or eight cities. And uh, it created this a kind of a renewed interest in, in the band and the archives. This is the um, Greenfield Palace. Uh, in, uh, is, this, is this the close to? 10 minutes, I'm not sure if I'm going over. The, the picture over here is uh, Maru, Maru, Maru from uh, God's Oasis. She's actually wearing a, a bra designed by Mike Kelly with the skulls on it. Um, and then this was our last installation um, that was at Prism Gallery. And um, I just, I remember how, seeing how austere it was. It was very orderly and very museum-like. And I think Mike designed this whole display of our work, and I think he wanted to keep it very um, conservative. And it was his last, one of his last things. He died a couple weeks after the end of that show. And these are the last pictures I, I took of Mike. And, um, you know, I just, I don't know how to, how, how, all I could say about him is that I remember him as a very funny person, a very humorous person, a very smart person. And you know, I really, uh, I really loved him, and like a brother. And you know, I think, uh, you know, it's a shame that I don't think he was appreciated as much as maybe he should have been. Um, after he died, I put together for a year. I worked on this show, uh, and it had to do with a vision that that Mike and I saw in a cornfield. We saw, we were out in Fowlerville around Halloween doing doing work on a Cameron uh, Jamie film. And we saw this car in the cornfield, and it was just rumbling, and it was glowing purple, and nobody was in it. And it was making this loud noise, and he said, Carrie, come out here, and let's film it. So I got out there, and we, we talked about recreating it for almost 10 years, and then finally, after he died, it was kind of easy. I got together with this group, Ogun, in Detroit, a black uh, Afrofuturist group. And that's Leroy Jones at the bottom there, who came to the opening and talked. Uh, this is Mary Claire in the basement of um, the mobile homestead, photographing an installation. And on the right is a, um, that's I think Jim Shaw and, and our setup, we're, we're doing a, a recording there in the basement. And you know, I hope that uh, you know, if you have a chance to maybe you know, learn more about him and come out to uh, see the mobile homestead. I think I'm, I'm good here. And I, I, I'd like to um, introduce you to Mary Claire Stevens next. Um, she was the studio manager uh, for over 10 years. And uh, she, I, I, I want to say that she was one of Mike's most trusted um, friends. And she was. And uh, she was also like, a, I guess, a, an office wife or a studio wife, a studio manager. but but they were very close, and please uh, give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to be here in uh, Ann Arbor. It's first time here, and it feels a bit mythical since Mike, uh, over the 10 years I worked with Mike, he talked a lot about Detroit, about Ann Arbor, 
And of course, I worked with him on many publications and uh, you know, saw pictures of his friends, et cetera. So it's great to be here. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna focus a bit on um, a moment in time when Mike sort of hit the art scene and tried to draw a thread through his work um, to the Mobile Homestead Project that hopefully will be somewhat cohesive for people. Um, just a moment and I'll get the slide up. So I thought I'd start oops, with this slide. Uh, this is a vintage photo of Mike's um, family home in, in uh, Westland. And this is Mike with his family in front of his home. And you can see the, uh, the nun in the background. Mike was raised Catholic. <laughs> so, you know, after Mike left Ann Arbor, he uh, went to CalArts uh, in 1976. He and Jim Shaw went there. And um, I think when I spoke with Mike, he really said it was, you know, a whole new scene for him. Um, he took it extremely seriously. And as Carrie said, he was a great reader. And uh, Cal Arts at the time had a lot of uh, artists there. Uh, Laurie Anderson taught there, uh, Douglas Schubler, you know, a conceptualist artist. So I think it was a whole new world for Mike. Um, this is a piece um, from the 80s. I'm skipping ahead a bit. Uh, he, he did quite well. And right out of school, you know, he was already performing in LA, um, very on the scene. Uh, he started early as a performance artist, um, dealing with very complex text-based performances that uh, were not videotaped, um, so we only have documentation of those as uh, photographs. Um, but later in his career, this is about 1986, um, he moved on to sculptures and objects and drawing. And this is a work called More Love Hours Than Can Ever Be Repaid. And next to it is a small piece called The Wages of Sin. And this piece was Mike's comment somewhat on the commodification uh, that was going on in the art world and also a little bit about gifts economy. And the idea here is these are all found objects um, from thrift stores. They're all handmade. And the idea was that the time it took to make these, you know, presumably by uh, your granny or your aunt um, and then given to you as a gift was really uh, somewhat um, akin to, uh, you know, forcing you to return love for this gift that they'd slaved over and made. And of course, it also makes reference to um, abstract painting. And uh, with a lot of Mike's work, he really was a genius at sort of um, congealing, you know, formal aspects of work, pop culture, um, psychology, you know, anything he had been reading. And I find that his works um, operate on so many levels and they're always very visually engaging and then you can go deeper and deeper. So the press's response to Mike's use of these found, you know, somewhat dirty, forlorn <laughs> stuffed animals was to say, oh, this artist, you know, he must have been abused. That what's, what's going on with him to use these, these, you know, sad animals in his artwork. And so Mike, you know, being very humorous and also um, I think a very organic and interactive um, kind of artist said, you know, I'm going to run with that. And if, if, the, if the public thinks I'm an abused artist, you know, maybe I'll start making work about my abuse. And so this is a, a form that you might fill out at a police department um, for it if you were abused. And you can see that in one point it says, you know, a summary by the abused person about what happened. He says, raised by zombies, brainwashed into a cult, left for dead, take me back, please. So this is sort of the beginning of this kind of thread of, of um, abuse, trauma to the artist, and possibly in a larger social way, and also institutional abuse. So this is a painting by Mike called Dirty Girl. It's from his student days. And he decided to sort of rework these older paintings um, through the lens of one of his abusers, Hans Hoffmann, who was well known for his push-pull theory um, in painting. And so Mike reworked these paintings um, over top, scribbling out um, and 
dealing with uh, the formal and the and the, you can see a, a sort of irreverent subject matter. Um, in 1994, he began dealing with um, memory and architecture, and this is just a sketch by Mike, and he was trying to start work on a project about every institution that he had ever attended, and he thought that he would um, try to recall from memory uh, the shape and structure of these um, various institutions. And this again was all tied to this notion of abuse and at the time in the 80s a very popularized psychological syndrome called repressed memory syndrome wherein uh, you would repress or um, you know push down uh, trauma that had occurred to you. So after he uh, did a, a series of preliminary drawings, he started building models, and this again, you might recognize it from the first slide, this is a model of his home. And in this project, everything that he could recall clearly, you know, was outlined, and the, the areas of architecture that he couldn't recall were left blank, or as solid sort of um, blocks. So this is his uh, family home in Westland. And here's another view of the model um, you may recognize some of the architecture. It's uh, the high school that he attended, John Glenn High School, uh, Stevenson Junior High, uh, Cal Arts. And here it is in the Whitney Museum under a case. So you can kind of see here, this is an overview, areas cut away where, where places he could remember, and then you, where you see solid blocks, those were areas he couldn't recall. And this is a painting called Timeless Painting Number no. 6, and this would have been created in this educational complex, which is the title of the piece that we just saw. And you can see it's very, um, again, very irreverent, sort of mixing and matching different sources, popular, comic, and abstract. And underneath the educational complex was the sublevel or the basement of uh, Cal Arts. And you actually, in order to see it, had to crawl under the table. And so now I'm switching to a, a work um, made in 2000. And uh, it was created in Detroit. He was uh, kind of riffing on this idea of memory, recollection, and its relation to art. And so this is his crew um, on the Detroit River. And they're dredging the river. Uh, for any bits of pieces that they could find. And Mike was really inspired by some memory wear he had come across, which are, you know, little bottles or um, jugs that are covered with keepsakes, you know, and it's a sort of folk art. And so what he did was make this very monumental um, memory wear with a statue of John Glenn in the middle there, uh, which was a statue that was in his high school. And then on the left, you can see what he called the Local Culture Pictorial Archive. And he collected and did a lot of research at the local newspaper of what he thought were also sort of folky stories um, spanning his time as an adolescent in, in uh, Westland in Detroit from 1968 to 1972. Um, part of the series was also uh, a photographic series that again, here's his house again. And this is a close-up of one of the local culture archives. So they're, they're quite a, a, a mixture of stories, everything from sewing clubs to ventriloquists and very quirky, um, funny, and sometimes somewhat creepy <laughs> um, stories. This is another photo edition from this series, which Mike called Blackout, again alluding to a sort of um, lapse in memory and he, as he was going down the river collecting materials, he made shots of the islands and the, the uh, banks of the Detroit River. And there was a mechanical error in the camera. And when he saw it uh, developed, he really liked how it looked. And so there are eight of these with most of the image blacked out. He next moved on to um, maybe 
returning a bit to his performance roots to a series called Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstructions. And these are based on uh, collections of yearbook um, images that he really um, collected over a period of maybe five to ten years. And he categorized them all into these <laughs> very funny categories. Some were thugs, vampires, sissies. You know, he would sort of make up these various um, categories. And this was the first one he did. And so on the left, you see the original source material uh, from a high school yearbook, some theatrical play. And then on the right, you see a production still from his video that um, is basically an extrapolation from that photograph. And uh, he sort of imposed a narrative on it. And in this case, it's a very melodramatic, um, dreary, uh, sort of almost like a teleplay um, that's influenced by Tennessee Williams. Um, and it's the tale of these two men who have a very uh, difficult uh, relationship. It's a 30-minute video. And then skipping ahead a bit to 2005, Mike continued to do the extracurricular uh, videos and combine them with sculptures. And here you see an installation in New York at Gagosian Gallery in 2005. And the sculptures were all made from props and sets that were used in the videos. And here's an example of a pairing of a original source and a reconstructed uh, memory. And so again, this plays with this idea of um, creating a narrative based on some presumable abuse. Um, and really just an excuse, I think, to explore a lot of other uh, cultural and um, social mores. And here's a sculpture called Devil's Door uh, that is the video component. And you can see it's just, it's a found uh, stall, which, which we found in Highland Park where Mike lived. And so this leads me somewhat uh, to the Mobile Homestead Project, which we started in 2005. And Mike was approached by a nonprofit in England called Art Angel um, to do a public project. And Mike said, oh, you know, I've got this idea, you know, I wanted to buy a plot of land or buy my, buy my old house and, and dig some tunnels underneath. And over time, the project sort of morphed due to a lot of, um, you know, budget issues and um, just different problems with obtaining land in Detroit. So the project really sort of transformed over time and ultimately uh, ended up being located on a, a grassy lot next to uh, MOCAD in Detroit. And here you see a rendering that we did back in 2006, which was Mike's uh, envisioning of this project, which is basically a full-scale replica of his house, um, and then a basement that reflected the floor plan, and then a sort of sub-level of tunnels, where you would basically go from one room in the basement go down, over, up into another room in the basement. And there were no doors in this second level, so the only way to get in and out of these spaces was to go through this tunnel system. Um, and, you know, Mike never got to see these tunnels built, but um, he was very interested and could imagine um, a sort of uh, spatial um, confusion and he was very interested in that, and I think he would have been really happy with them because they certainly are uh, confusing. <laughs> Here's an overhead that might help you understand the project. Um, because of, uh, originally Mike had wanted to make the whole house mobile, and his concession um, was to make a portion of it mobile, which you can see with this dotted line, the front facade of the house is actually a trailer with wheels and it gets towed by a cab. And then here's an ab above view of the basement level and you can see the sort of diagram of going up and down these stairwells to the basement level. And here's a side view of the um, mobile portion of the homestead. And, you know, this project started in 2005. It was just getting um, completed or beginning to be completed in 2012. And many public art projects do take some time. Um, 
takes a lot of people, um, budgets, funding. Um, this is another rendering of it on the site, and this shows the house all together, and this shows the trailer driving away with the front of the house. And then this is another view where you can see the sort of open hole, which would be uh, use, put over with vinyl or plywood so that the house would be usable. And this was a, um, uh, to be a community center or a gallery, or very public. So this was the public part of the project. And the tunnels were the private part of the, the project, which Mike wanted to reserve for himself. And he, oops. Oh, here we go, sorry. Um, you know, he, and he intended to do another series of extracurricular uh, videos down in the tunnels, and which seems a very fitting place for it, you know. Uh, so this is a rendering of the mobile homestead driving through Greenfield Village, which maybe all of you have been to. I certainly uh, made a visit there last time I was here. And he liked the idea of this mobile part of his family home kind of orbiting around Greenfield Village because of course Greenfield Village is, you know, has all these famous people's homes or workshops and he liked the idea of this Midwestern every man's house just kind of like a little fly buzzing around and he also thought that he might park it until they kicked him out. <laughs> and so um, this video that you're about to see was actually shot in 2010. We completed the trailer build um, without making the rest of the house because Mike was a bit concerned as time went on that the whole project would be finished. And he was extremely um, pragmatic sometimes in terms of, you know, he had his vision and he wanted to um, get things done. And he had a lot of projects he wanted to do. So he thought, you know, I'm going to make a video. If this, if this whole project never happens, at least I'll have this video. And he sort of went in that direction. And his idea was to uh, go up and down Michigan, or pardon me, east and west on Michigan Avenue from downtown Detroit, where the public project was to be built, to his home in Westland. And along the way, stopping by various sites and doing interviews with various people who lived and worked along Michigan Avenue. And so, of course, he was fascinated by the change in the fabric, um, you know, from downtown Detroit to Dearborn, which is primarily a Middle Eastern community, to Inkster, to the, the suburbs. And he really was fascinated, since his time in Detroit, um, how things had changed and transformed. And it's a, it's a fairly straight document, document uh, pardon me, documentary, you know, for Mike. Um, the extracurricular projective videos were very fantastical, um, lots of costumes, and this is um, fairly straight, but um, you'll, you'll see when you watch the movie that you'll, you'll hear Mike's voice uh, throughout in subtle ways. And so this is a, a resident in Ingster in front of her home. And then finally, uh, let's see, we did the launch after we shot the video, and this is the launch at MoCAD with just the trailer and some various public speakers. This is Marsha Myro from MoCAD. This is James Lingwood from Art Angel, all giving some speeches. And this is John Sinclair, um, who Mike really uh, loved and looked up to. And this is Mike. Um, you know, christening the, the mobile homestead. And there was a, 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 a bunch of local bands were invited to come. Uh, here's the, the crowd. <laughs> Mike was a little disappointed in the turnout. Um, this is the trailer uh, in front of Central Station, in front of Greenfield Village. And we did a food drive because the trailer was supposed to also be um, a public work that would do social service. And Mike sort of felt very strongly that any public artwork, you know, it should do some kind of social good. So he had plans to maybe do a needle exchange using the mobile homestead, a bookmobile. Um, but when push came to shove at the time of the launch, um, we decided that a food drive would be, um, you know, the most the best we could do for the time period we had to open the project. And it was great. 
Um, Forgotten Harvest was invited and they set up a place at Greenfield Village. Here it is outside Mike's school, St. Mary's. And then we built the rest of this project, which had already been planned and signed off by Mike in 2012. And so here's some construction shots. Here's the hole, the basements. And there it is. And this is the opening <laughs> with For Freaks Only. And this is the interior of the homestead. This is the sort of library that's set up there now. And some community crafts. And a place for community literature. And a sort of meeting room. And the idea is that this is an empty kind of vessel for the community and arts organizations in the community um, to come in and, and make use of uh, for exhibitions, meetings, events, and um, it's a really an experiment um, and just getting going. And then downstairs in the basement, the idea is to have a program there that's private um, and uh, Carrie Lauren, who you just uh, met, is, is sort of launching that um, and inviting uh, people to perform and, and make use of the, the private um, basement. And so there's, a, of course, this idea of the public and the private, you know, artist versus the public idea of what art should be. All sorts of really interesting questions posed by this artwork. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the first of Mike's films for the Mobile Homestead. It's called Going West from downtown Detroit to Westland on Michigan Avenue. And uh, this is the first part of a three-part trilogy. There's going west, going east, and then the christening. And he saw them as, a, as an installation um, that might be shown simultaneously, um, but also as a straight narrative, which could be seen one, two, three. So uh, please enjoy, it's my pleasure to um, show the film and thanks for coming out. <laughs> 